All right. For today's critical thought, we're returning to the topic of quality of life systems in game design. And more specifically, how do you decide what elements are considered quality of life and where can your game stand to be improved by them? Now, if you missed the previous video, quality of life systems are elements that make your game easier to experience without directly impacting or adding to the gameplay. So a good example would be something like air conditioning in a car. Air conditioning makes you, driving your car more enjoyable, but it doesn't make the car handle better or make you a better driver. And what makes it very tricky to talk about quality of life systems is the fact that anything that's considered an accessibility option is also quality of life, but not every quality of life option can be considered accessibility. Now, when we talk about examples from the accessibility side, we can look at things like colorblind mode, input or button mapping, subtitles, ways to cut down on repetitive motions for people who suffer from those kinds of maladies, and so on. But the question is, how do you decide when you need a quality of life system that's just more on the game design side? And, more, and to follow up on that, what do you focus your attention on? And that's what we want to talk about today. And I was thinking about this, and I have a pretty simple solution. And it has to do with your game's core gameplay loop. If you don't know what that term is, the core gameplay loop is essentially the primary system or mechanic related to playing your game. It's the major bullet point that you're going to use to sell your title. So if it's a platformer, run and jump, first person shooting, first person shooting, and so on. And when it comes to figuring out ways to improve your game with quality of life systems, the best way to do this is by comparing to your core gameplay loop. Are there any elements or things that the player is doing that is either distracting or taking them away from that gameplay loop? And if there are, that's the first place you should look at ways to improve your game's quality of life. And while I have a few examples we're going to talk about, I'm curious what you folks think in terms of some great examples of quality of life systems along these lines. But the ones that I like to think about come from the ARPG side. When we talk about the ARPG genre, we've talked about the three core loops. You fight monsters to get more powerful, to fight more monsters, and then so on, and we repeat it over again. And when it comes to that idea of fight, collect, and grow more powerful, anything that gets in the way or stops you from playing could be or is an example of distracting from the core gameplay loop. And anyone who's played an ARPG knows that two of the biggest ways that time can be lost are comparing items in your inventory and managing or sorting your inventory. So one of the things we've seen lately with ARPGs is an easy way to directly compare items with what you're wearing versus what's in your inventory. I can see immediately, okay, this item gives me all green value, so it's better than what I have. And then auto sort takes out the need for the player to sit there and manually move items in and out in their crazy Tetris organization. And that takes me to the first major point for this video. When we talk about ways to improve your game via quality of life, we're not talking about these grand sweeping changes that will transform a game into from a 7 out of 10 to a game of the year or remove 5 to 10 minutes of annoyance out of your title. What we're talking about are things that can reduce seconds of play. Sometimes could be as little as 1 second, sometimes could be as long as 5 to 10. And I know what you're thinking. What is the big deal about 5 to 10 seconds away from your core gameplay loop? And this is the important part. When we're talking about these kinds of situations, they're happening consistently. This could be a case of every 5 minutes of play, I have to stop for 5 to 10 seconds. And that time adds up. And this is incredibly true when we're talking about games meant to be played in the long run your 50 to 100 hour RPGs or your MMOs as well. That if I'm spending every, let's say every 10 minutes of play, I have to stop and spend 30 seconds away from your game. That means that hopefully if I did the math right, that you will spend at least, I think 
five or six minutes. Again, it's hard to do math when you're trying to talk at the same time, but you'll spend at least five or six minutes not playing your game in the span of that hour. And again, the more time you're spent away, it starts to rub the wrong rub against you in a matter of speaking when you're trying to play a title. Very recently, you're, or by the time you're watching this video, I did a recording of the game Dark Quest 2 that is on Steam right now. And I found several big or very noticeable areas where they could improve with some quality of life adjustments. And again, we're only talking about a few seconds out of your gameplay, but when it's happening consistently over the span of a 20 or 30 minute play, it starts to eat at you, and it can become very frustrating to play. Now, going back to the core gameplay loop, again, when we're talking about these decisions, they can be any manner of error. It could be as simple as UI, or it could be directly playing the game itself. But commonly, again, it's about anything that's getting in the way of that loop. Now, here's a classic example that I used before. That imagine if we're playing an action-adventure game, and in order to open up a door, I need to go to my inventory, go to my keys, select the key, hit the confirmation prompt, click on use, put my mouse over the door, <laughs> click on the key, click on open, click on another confirmation prompt, then I have to click on the doorknob, click open the door, and then click a yet another confirmation prompt. Now thankfully I don't think we've seen any examples that go to that extreme, but obviously the simplest way of doing that, or getting rid of that quality of life element, is simply making a lot of those decisions automatic. And that's another major point when it comes to quality of life systems, and another way to spot if your game could use some trimming. And it goes to this question. Is the action the player doing something that requires thought? And I know that sounds very simple. But we have seen this in a lot of games where the player is forced to essentially jump through hoops either through design or systems that offer no real thought process whatsoever. Such as every time I have to use a potion, I have to go into my inventory. Or if I want to equip my latest weapon, I may have to go three panels deep into a UI. Again, anything that distracts from that core gameplay loop is not good. And it's doubly so if it's not even a decision that the player has to make, because it's something that they're going to do by choice or by force. So any way that you can get rid of those elements is ultimately a net positive. And here's a really great example of this. In Darkest Dungeon, a major part of exploring the dungeons is using various items on curios. And you use the right item, you'll get a positive result. Use the incorrect item, you may get nothing or a bad one. And this choice is fixed for each curio. So once you figure out what the right item is, that's going to be the same for every version of that item until the end of the game. So once you figure it out, it's not really a choice, it's just memorization. So after many, many patches, Red Hook has finally put in an in game. Uh, memory for that. So whenever I go to a curio, it will now show up all the items that I've used and what was the result. So if I see like a little coin icon, that means that item works for that curio. And I know some people may think of that as dumbing down, but again, there's not really a choice in the matter. And if you're just forcing the player to jump through mental hoops, it's not really good design. One of my favorite examples is simply having an auto map feature in game. And again, people will say, well, why don't you just draw your own map? But again, anything that distracts from the core gameplay loop is a bad element for your game. Because again, we may only be talking about a few seconds at a time, but when it's happening repeatedly and consistently, it just will hurt a title. And with that said though, like, like we said a few minutes ago, these changes aren't going to right a sinking ship. If your game is bad, having all the quality of life features in the world is not going to turn it into an amazing game. 
But these elements are the difference between games that are great and the ones that are the most amazing and usually game you know, of the year winners for their respective years. Because it's just about creating as enjoyable of an experience as you can at, from a game development standpoint. And it's also just really good design practice. Because the more someone plays a game and likes it, well, that's great for them. Now, another good example I want to quickly touch on is the use of dynamic UIs as an element or paint on the screen that change to reflect what the player is currently looking at. And that is a really great example of a quality of life element. My favorite part of that, or my favorite example that I go back to is from City Skylines and how it pulls up the respective information of the uh, requested civic service based on what building type I'm looking at. So if I click on police, it's going to pop up the UI for all security. If I click on firefighter or fire department, you know, what's my fire safety system or my fire safety rating? And again, anything that you can use to keep the player focused on your game, so much the better. Now with that said, the final part for today's video goes back to what we said at the beginning. How do you decide what to focus on? Because in a perfect world, you would have all the time and money and energy to do everything. But, some, but for a lot of developers, that's obviously not the case. And this is where that magical word playtesting comes in. Because the best people to tell you if there's any issues with learning your game are people who've never played your game before. And this is why it's very important to start playtesting early and often once you have a solid build off the ground. Because these are the people who are going to be looking at your game for the first time. And if there's anything confusing or hard to understand, that is a very good point to try and adjust for the future. And of course, we've discussed about the challenges of playtesting and being able to separate the signal from the noise. If one person complains that your game is hard to play, okay, that's a bad thing, but we can overlook it. If 500 people say your game is hard to play, then there might be something there for you to consider. And when it comes to this, it's always important to get feedback from your consumers. Now, with that said though, if your community or you yourself are split on various quality of life features, then offer multiple options in-game. Now, with that said though, one final and very important consideration. Just because you have these features in the options menu, doesn't basically absolve you of mentioning it. Because I've seen this from many indie developers. When I'm talking about having trouble with the game or I'm not understanding something, and they'll say, oh, it's in the in-game options. But you never told me there was something in the in-game options. And that's another major lesson. Oh, jeez, my phone just decided to go crazy like that. But we're still going, folks. Just because you have the feature in the options doesn't mean someone's going to necessarily look at it. Just like with the manual, you can't expect people to look outside of actually playing your game for this information. And this goes back to the playtesting that we just mentioned. If people are having trouble with a certain element or the fan base is split, maybe have an in-game prompt or tooltip to let people know that, hey, do you, are you having trouble with this or do you prefer so-and-so? Well, check the options, it could be there. But again, if you're doing your job right from a playtesting and design standpoint, a lot of these issues should be corrected before the game is even in the retail or the store space. You don't want to have to be adding quality of life uh, systems in post-release. This is stuff that should have been caught in playtesting or on early access for those developers who go that route. So, with that said, thank you so much for watching today's Critical Thought. If you're new, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Let me know if you have any suggestions for future vlog topics. But otherwise, check back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where we examine the art and science of games. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Check back around 10 Eastern for regular streaming. If you like to suggest games for me to cover or topics to talk about, let me know in the comments below. For a collection of my writings as well as weekly podcasts on design, check out game-wisdom.com. To support the Game Wisdom Patreon, you can find us on there 
on patreon.com slash gwbicer. A dollar will get you into our private Discord channel where we talk game topics and more. Five dollars will get you voting privileges for any major event, including the Saturday Night Grab Bag, Patreon-funded goals, and more. Thanks again for watching, and I hope you enjoy more videos here on the Game Wisdom YouTube channel.